Let's see, I'm going to um, talk about several different topics today. The first is um, a story that appeared in the New York Times today. Um, Fermilab uh, uh, announced a possible discovery. It's not clear. Uh, it's not clear whether the the effect is first of all what's called a 3.2 sigma effect, and three sigma effects sometimes go away. So this could be simply a mistake in analyzing the data, or it could be simply a statistical fluctuation, which when they analyze more data will disappear. Um, what they're doing is PP bar goes to uh, lepton plus jets, and um, so the signal is essentially, this goes to WZ, for example, and that goes, the W then goes to lepton plus nu bar, or anti-lepton plus nu, and the Z goes to two jets. And of course, they don't see the neutrino, and so the signal is lepton plus jets plus um, missing transverse energy, which is the uh, or transverse momentum, which is the uh, due to the neutrino. And um, what's possibly going on? Well, and of course, they're all. It's another thing that they're seeing is that's not p vector, it's p p bar goes to uh, w w, and again this goes to um, let's just say left on bar new this time, and this goes to j j. Okay. Now what's what's strange is that the jet jet uh, momentum seems to have a peak, uh, a peak at an invariant, invariant mass, well, all masses are invariant, um, m equal to about 140 to 150 GeV. Well, over c squared, if one bothers with um, what is it? It doesn't seem to be a standard model Higgs. Um, nobody knows what it is. And as I said, it could go away. So I just thought I'd mention that. Um, I brought a laptop in, but whether we can want to see this, I don't know. I can just tell you, uh, remember, this was um, from something like 10 to, I don't know, 150 GeV for energy. And uh, this was alpha S of mu. And it, the point that we know about is, for example, 91.2 GeV is about 0 0.118. And um, I showed you the curve last time, which sort of did this. If that was the one loop curve, if you put in two loops and three loops, you get something that looks more like this. And uh, it, it, again, this is for lambda equal to about 250 uh, MeV. So I don't think we need to get to show those curves. It's just you, you could look at them, uh, the, 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 the online book, chapter 18, section three years ago. Um, I want to say a little more about Goldstone's theorem, a lot more about the Anderson-Higgs mechanism, and um, uh, something about superfluidity, and um, something about uh, the Landau Ginsburg um, uh, theory. So let me ch oh, and something about non relativistic um, Let me try to get this 
stuff straight here. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, do you have any questions about um, about the Goldstone theorem? All right. Um, let me just mention one thing about it. Uh, what we saw was that if you have a, um, a spontaneously broken symmetry, then um, all right, let's see. Maybe I will say a word about it since we're a new arrival. The New York Times today reported ah, yes. a. Um, yeah, we heard about it already. Of a 1.96 TV particle? No, it's 133 GV. <laughs> well, it's up in their range of 140, 150 uh, GV. And it was seen in this PP bar goes to what they see is lepton plus jet plus missing energy due to a missing neutrino. And so either a W or a Z goes to jet jet. And the jet jet seemed to have an invariant mass of around 140, 150. Uh, it could be the Higgs, but it, it's not the standard model. Yes. Um, it could also be why is, why is a statistical that? fluctuation. How do they know that it's not the standard model Higgs? What's the because the standard model Higgs would have actually much lesser cross section. Okay. It's. Uh, 15 femtobonds, whereas this thing is coming in at four picobonds. So it's a factor of several hundred, mm -hmm. too strong a signal. Okay. This paper, by the way, I think is one of the worst written papers oh, we in the history that, actually, of science. Huh? <laughs> we looked at it in our, our weekly group meeting over here, and uh, we thought the same thing, apparently. I didn't read it yet, but I don't plan to. Just awful. Um, is it all about their, what their I mean, the, the, statistics and analysis? They didn't have any description of what was going on. In other words, the stuff that I just said to you, they didn't say that. Okay. I got this from Igor, <laughs> who's a very smart guy, by the way. All right, and the other thing I wanted to say was I uh, updated the plot of uh, alpha s from the one loop result to a Three loop result, and there um, you have the, the curve falls faster and more or less goes through the experimental point. Um, now, with regard to the Goldstone theorem, um, let, let's see, you guys missed that. Do you want me to review the Goldstone theorem? I don't know what it is, so that would be nice. <clears throat> All right. So it'll be a review for you, but reviewing is good. All right. So suppose Q is a conserved charge. If Q annihilates the vacuum, then uh, Q generates a symmetry. I remember I was a graduate student when Sidney Coleman wrote a paper, um, a symmetry of the vacuum is a symmetry of the what he meant was, you can have e to the minus i theta q. Let me just write it as uh, you can always do this. So this is a generator in the sense that it's like it's generating a Lie group element or something. Yeah, because it's a, a bend. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, you can always write this no matter what Q is, because you've just written one, one, two, three times. And of course, you can have N fields here. If, however, this thing, if Q annihilates the vacuum, you can drop this term. And so then what you get here is A theta one of X one, A theta two of X two, And of course, what we started with was this, which is just a one of x one, a two of x two, and here, of course, a theta is just 
e to the i theta cube a e to the minus i theta cube. So this is a transformation, a symmetry transma transformation. It's a symmetry transformation if uh, amplitudes remain the same, uh, or if absolute values of amplitudes remain the same. And so in particular, you could formulate field theory in terms of mean values per vacuum of products of field operators. And so this is um, the symmetry of the theory. So yeah. like the actual electric charge satisfies these two things, right? Yeah. Which, which means that the, that the vacuum has no charge. Mm -hmm. And that the charge commutes for how it's All right. The thing that's really cute about this is that is, if q0 isn't 0, then q0 is some state, which we can call, um, let's just call that s sub 0. And what's the energy of it? Well, h q of 0 is the same thing as h q minus q h of 0, because h on 0, the vacuum has 0 energy. I mean, you, of course, add a constant to h so that the vacuum has zero energy. Um, but on the other hand, this is just hq, which is zero because the charge is conserved. So this is zero. That means that the energy of this state uh, is zero. But it's not the vacuum. No. <laughs> Um, and now, what you do is you say, um, that's actually an interesting remark you made. Um, what about the case where Q on the vacuum is a non zero, the vacuum is a non zero eigen right. state? Plus one eigen value. Like plus one eigenstate. For example, if it's any real eigenvalue, um, that's an exception. We're not considering that. But that's an interesting thing and one uh, it's worth looking at, perhaps. All right. Now define S to the K as integral d cubed x e to the minus i k dot x j0 of x and t 0. Where j zero uh, zero is d, g, d mu j mu, and j mu is the conserved current that gives rise to the, to the charge q is integral d q x of j zero x. Okay. All right. Now, what happens? Um, clearly, s sub k goes to s sub zero as k goes to zero. Well, it just becomes q zero, which is s zero. Um, on the other hand, s sub k has momentum k, and um, the way you see that is p sub i on s sub k is integral d. You want me to go through the details, or is it obvious? Uh, it's not obvious to me. So I mean. It actually, let me give a different proof of it. Let me give a different proof of it from the one that I gave last time. This thing is e to the minus i kx pi j0 of x and t. Uh, actually, this is a different proof. Um, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do a different proof in the following way. Do e to the minus i a dot p, okay? E to the minus i a dot p. And now we have the vacuum here, so we can always toss in an e v i a dot p. It won't make any difference because p and the, moment, the vacuum has zero momentum. So this gives you J0 of x plus a t. 
with e to the minus i kx. Okay. Now um, you just translate x goes to x minus a, and what you get is integral d to x e to the minus i k x minus a j zero. And now you see this is e to the i k dot a. So that seems like the wrong sign. All right, well, in that case, there's a plus here. Okay. I didn't keep track of this one. <laughs> okay, so that, so what we've got then is a state S of K that has momentum K, and as the momentum goes to zero, it goes to a state of zero energy. That means it's a massless particle. So there's a massless massless boson in the, in the theory. Um, boson if Q is a bosonic charge. If Q had been a fermionic charge, I guess it would have been a massless fermion. Um, and so, <clears throat> so what's, what would be the difference? Is it in the expansion in terms of raising the Morgan operators? Like you give me Q, how do I know Q is bosonic or fermionic? Oh, well you'd have to know what Q was. Right. I mean it comes from, if we were dealing with supersymmetry it would be a fermionic charge. But most charges are bosonic. In fact the book I was stealing this from just considered the bosonic case. So it would just be the fields that are in that expression for Q, right? Yes. So you'd see what the fields were, and that would tell you. Um, a, a canonical example is L is a half um, a half d mu phi star d mu phi, um, or if you want to be careful, d over mu phi plus mu squared over two phi star phi minus lambda over 4 pi star phi squared. So um, mu squared here has the wrong sign. And so the minimum of the potential is at um, uh, phi equal to, um, what is it? Let's see. Um, we usually call it V and mu over square root of 2 lambda. So that's the minimum. This is the, what's called the Mexican hat potential, where um, this is the minimum. And um, so the deal is if, if you, uh, you can imagine phi is, you can write it as phi 1 plus i phi 2, or you can write it as rho e to the i theta. And um, if you write it in that way, then the Lagrangian is rho squared d theta squared plus d rho squared plus mu squared rho squared minus lambda root of the fourth. And um, after symmetry breaking, you let rho equal v plus chi, and then the Lagrangian is d squared d theta squared plus oh, d chi squared minus 2 mu squared chi squared minus 4 uh, square root mu squared lambda over 2 chi cubed minus lambda chi over 4 uh, plus square root 2 mu squared over lambda chi plus chi squared theta squared uh, minus lambda v to the fourth. So the point is that now chi has mass mu, but uh, theta is massless. Okay. And this the theta is then called a Nambu Goldstone. Um, 
Now, this happens in three or four dimensions, but it turns out in two dimensions there's an infrared divergence, which means that uh, this analysis doesn't really work. Um, there's more detail in the notes, but I think I should move on. So, any, any questions? Let's see, you've asked a couple of questions. So you get like probably both of you have asked questions. I have a question. <laughs> All right. Um, so now let's look at the Anderson Higgs mechanism. Uh, uh, professor, can I ask you to repeat something, please? What? Uh, can I ask you to repeat something? Which yeah. Is, uh, so what again is the symmetry breaking term of this? What again is the symmetry breaking term in this? Oh, all right, hold on. Milky Way, good enough? Yeah. Thank you. The symmetry breaking term, well, effectively it's this. It's, it's these two. It's the nature of the potential. Because the potential has this shape where the radial direction from this axis of symmetry is the absolute value of the field. Or the, of the, the absolute value of the field. I mean, let's let's talk in pathological terms. Then we can talk about just simply the absolute value of the field. So it's the absolute value of the field. When that absolute value of the field lies in this uh, on this circle, you're minimizing the energy. Because of course the Lagrangian has is the kinetic term minus the potential energy. So the energy is lambda over the fourth phi to the fourth minus mu squared over 2 phi squared. So, so it's, it's the fact that the minimum is not at phi equals 0, but at a non-zero value of phi that breaks the symmetry. Why does it break the symmetry? Because it means that the field has to assume some value on this ring. It has to make a choice yeah, how does it make that choice? Any place as good as any other, right? That's right. And uh, as Gelman has often said, it makes an unsymmetrical choice from a select a symmetrical set of equivalent vacua. Meaning? Meaning all these possible vacua are equally okay, right. and it just picks one. Randomly. Well, now you're getting to <laughs> you're getting to a whole raft of deep questions. Um, let's not go there. Okay, because th this is why I, why I've never been. A, this is probably the fourth or fifth time I've seen this, but I've never oh. been able to understand it. Yeah. So one other way I've read about thinking of symmetry breaking is that um, <clears throat> the things the symmetry of the Hamiltonian or the Lagrangian, but it's not a symmetry of the the ground space. Oh, for thing. sure. Yeah. So is, that, is that what this is saying over here? Over here, all right, let's see. That is, Q commutes with H, cool. Uh, but then Q on the vacuum, if Q on the vacuum is some other non zero energy state, but it's like, you know, it's in the same. Right, no, no, you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely yeah. right. This is saying so that's that when Q right. hits the vacuum, you're not getting zero. Right. So that those first, those top two lines right there are also represent uh, like a spontaneous symmetry breaking. Is that what? Yes. The right. Nomenclature? Yes. Okay. And by the way, the distinction between spontaneous and dynamical has to do with whether the field is elementary or composite. In other words, in for example, superconductivity. The field you're talking about is a field representing Cooper pairs mm -hmm. of electrons. And uh, so then you say that if that field breaks a symmetry, that's dynamical symmetry break. So that's some of the crazy lingo that we've got. At least the lingo that's crazy now is in English. <laughs> there used to be crazy lingo in German. Um, I think actually the crazy lingo in German was more literate than the crazy lingo. Like Zitterbevagen? Zitterbevagen, yeah. Jitterbevagen? <laughs> um, right. Okay, so let's see. What do. All right, let me.
me, let me say one thing about this. You could imagine, if you want, building up a Hilbert space around this vacuum instead of that vacuum. Now, because this is a kinetic energy term here, any gradients add to the energy, any spatial gradients. So you don't want, uh, it, so the vacuum that you build around this has the same field at every point in space. And the, back, and the vacuum you build around this one has the same field at every point in space, because you add energy if you vary, if you let this thing move around, okay? But move around on different vacuum. Yeah, at different places, all right? Now, imagine some physical state in this, built, built upon this vacuum and some physical state built upon that vacuum. It turns out they're orthogonal if the volume of space is infinite. Uh, uh, how do we make sense of that? Well, it's just, all right, the true representation of these would, uh, at least the lowest order, would be as coherent states. And uh, the inner product of these two coherent states then uh, would in fact involve uh, a divergent integral if the volume of space is, is infinite. Yeah. All right. So so that's basically what's that that tells you that that tells you then that you can't. You can't, have, it doesn't make sense to have a superposition of states in these two places. But that's not a complete answer to your question. Um, and, uh, you know, in reality, you can, you can imagine that in the early universe when this happened, uh, uh, maybe for some reason, one point on this thing was a little lower than the others. And it, bang, it hit, hit there. Or it's also that there are, you might have had fluctuations in you know different parts of the universe, and it just happens that in our part of the universe we're here. Okay, there might be some other place where it's there. All right, this is all very very speculative. <laughs> we try to give you just the normal stuff. Sure. Okay, the party line is worth learning. The other stuff is is, is more difficult. All right, let's look at the Anderson Higgs mechanism. This is the, the standard Higgs mechanism of how gauge bosons get mass. And it's, it'll be twice for you to know. Oh. Um, all right, we take L as minus a quarter F mu nu F mu nu plus D phi, let me just write it, D phi star D phi plus mu squared phi star phi minus lambda phi star phi squared. Right. The covariant, let, let's make this a U1 field, so D, D mu B is D mu minus I E A mu B, this is the covariant derivative. Let phi grow E to the I theta. Then this D mu phi is D mu rho plus I rho d mu theta minus e a mu e to the i theta. Okay. When you put that back into the equation, what you get is minus a quarter f mu nu f mu nu. Now here's the covariant derivative term. It's rho squared d mu theta minus a mu squared. And then there are other terms that are a little less interesting. D rho squared plus mu squared rho squared minus lambda rho to the four. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Now, let's factor an E out of this. Or effectively, let's write this as plus rho squared E squared a mu minus 1 over e d mu theta squared. So these two things are equivalent. Okay? These two things 
are equivalent, and we can define B mu as A mu minus 1 over D, D mu theta. So, and moreover, um, we're going to um, expect that, of course, rho is going to have a certain value in the vacuum, namely, um, rho is going to be what minimizes this, which is, in this case, mu over the square root of lambda, which we call v. Okay. So, in the original action, or in the original Lagrangian, of um, the Anderson Higgs, the U1. So theory. this is called the Anderson Higgs Lagrangian. You so, can if you want. so this is a U1 gauge field yes. inside of F, and then phi is the Higgs field. So phi is the Higgs field. Yes. Okay. And so what are our, what are like rho and well the other ones? What we do is, rho. is we're setting phi equal to rho e to the i theta, mm -hmm. which makes a nicer uh, notation. Then the so are, are both rho and theta fields in that expression? Yes, okay. rho and theta are both fields, and this is what the covariant derivative looks like. Sure. And then when you put it up here and unpack it, this is what you get. And so you see that the covariant derivative of the angle um, is of the form rho squared e squared times this. This a mu minus 1 over e d mu you can think of as it's a you can think of it as a gauge field, but it's actually a gauge invariant field. Because when A mu changes, theta changes and the changes cancel. In any event, D oh and F mu nu is it's D mu A nu minus D nu A mu, but it's also D mu B nu minus D nu mu because the the theta derivative cancels. Okay. Oh yeah. And so what does this Lagrangian look like now? After symmetry breaking it looks like this. Minus a quarter F mu nu F mu nu plus a half M squared B mu where, where M is EV, because rho takes the value V. Oh, we're assuming that, yeah, we're making that. Right, in the vacuum. And what else do we have here? Well, let me say that the rest of this theory, I'm not going to write the whole thing down, but it's, it's effectively this plus higher order terms. And so what we've got is we've got a massive vector boson and a scalar field of mass m. So now let's, let's think about modes. We started with, before symmetry breaking, we had A mu massless. And what do you have? You have two, for each momentum, you have two states, plus and minus uh, velocity. And then you have um, this field phi, which is, uh, a complex scalar field, so there are two scalar fields, and before symmetry breaking, they're both massless. Two massless scalar fields. So you all together have four fields, essentially. After symmetry breaking, you have B mu, which is massive, mass M, three modes, or three fields if you want, because you can have plus and minus and trans, and uh, It's no longer massless, so you don't have the thing that happens with the photon. Right, right. And 
you have the field kind mass mu. So essentially it's the Goldstone mechanism, but one of the massless modes combines with the uh, gauge boson to form a massive vector boson. It's a massive vector boson and then just a scale of field. Okay. And this is thought to be the way all of these things happen. Um, let me speak of it more generally. Suppose you have a group G before symmetry breaking. It goes down to a group H, which is a subgroup of G. Suppose there are N of G generators. Then you have N of G massless uh, gauge bosons to start with. Um, suppose after symmetry breaking, H is the invariant subgroup. So why are the, the gauge bosons corresponding to the generators of the group? Well, when we have a gauge theory, for every generator we have a gauge boson. It's um, it's just the way the cookie crumbles. In other words, um, let's look at a, a general field. Psi prime is equal to psi plus I theta A T A psi. These are the generators, they say n by n matrices. And so you want a covariant derivative here, which is something like d mu plus I uh, A A mu T A. Right. Okay. So for each generator you have a gauge field. And they're massless to start with. But now after symmetry breaking, suppose this is the only, that this is the symmetry that is uh, a symmetry of the, inf of the whole theory, that is to say of the, of the vacuum, to use Coleman's term. And then what you have is you have NH massless gauge bosons left, and then you have N of G minus N of H massive vector bosons. And they each, those, those uh, things get, you see, when you started out with N of G, um, you had effectively N of G charges. Is it that many charges really? Anyway, you let's just say that there are enough in order for this to happen, there are enough Goldstone bosons that in the in the Lingo of the field get eaten by the mass escape bosons, which become massive. Well, that's the picture. Let's look at an example that's actually <coughs> worth knowing about. Su five. Here, there are basically in this theory there are basically two Higgs fields. There's a Higgs field that breaks Su five, and then there's another Higgs field of the, the Higgs field of the standard model. So it breaks SU5 down into? SU3 cross SU2 cross SU1. Okay. So phi is a uh, 5 by 5 trace uh, Hermitian matrix field. And phi prime, uh, phi is equal, phi prime is equal to phi plus I Theta A, TA phi actually it transforms in the adjoint representation, so it looks like this. You could still write it as some T prime acting on phi from the left, but um, one tends to do this. So the covariant derivative is D mu minus I G A A mu TA phi. And A goes from 1 to 24. There are 24 generators for SU5. 
Uh, all right, but just as there are eight for SU3, it's n squared minus one. Um, so phi then is a four, phi by phi, the mean value in the vacuum or the VEV of phi is a five by five Hermitian matrix that's traceless. You can diagonalize it, and so you can write it as this thing is equal to Vj delta Ij. And uh, V1 plus V5 is zero. And um, so what is the mean value in the vacuum of the trace of d mu phi, d mu phi. Well, it's going to be a g squared. It's going to be a trace. And in the covariant derivative, what remains is, oh, this is d mu, sorry, this is d mu phi. You ignore this, and what you get is just this part where this is the bed. What do you ignore the first part? Oh, because we're taking the mean value in the vacuum, and the mean value in the vacuum of the derivative of the, of the Higgs field is zero. Um, and so, in fact, what this would look like actually is Ta comma V, where V is, in other words, this thing is V, the matrix. It's diagonal and real and traceless. Some reason the text I'm following here, which is a uh, disease book, is uh, he flips the sign of this. I right? don't really know why he does that, but he may be right. So let's do this. So that's the trace, and that multiplies a a mu a g mu. Okay, so because in the covariant derivative you have a g, you have a gauge field, you have a generator, and you have a the Higgs field. And you have then that commutator. Okay, well, let's suppose that V is of this form. Apart from an overall factor alpha, it's got to be traceless. So let's call it 2, 2, 2, minus 3, minus 3. The reason why I'm making this constant and this constant is I want to leave SU3 and SU2 invariant. And so what this does is that we have Ta comma V zero for if, if we say for 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 gauge fields that well for generators I should say generators that are of the form Say the lambda Gelm the, the lambda of Gelman in the three by three, and then whatever zeros down here. These commute with V. Are we, are we happy? Yeah, because it's just proportional to the identity. Right. Yeah. Right. Moreover, T A equal to The Pauli matrices which generate SU2, these also commute with V. Okay. So what that means is that th this, by the way, is the mass matrix. This, we can rewrite this as um, one half M squared AB, AA, AB, mu, mu. And so the, the masses. The squared masses of the gauge bosons are, are what you get when you diagonalize this matrix, which is that matrix. And you see then that that matrix uh, has, um, it's zero whenever this is one of the SU3 fields or one of the SU2 fields. Another matrix that commutes with this is, of course, the, the V itself. And V itself is another generator because it's a traceless emission matrix. So altogether then there are 8 plus 3 plus 1, 12 generators that commute with 
V. And so there are 12 gauge bosons that reach in massless. These are the gluons, the W, the Z, and the photon. And did I leave something else? Well, two W's and a Z and the photon. You guys are gonna watch out for the chocolate or do you have professor it? Who's you're gonna steal it. You want to mess the crunch? Isn't it getting a little old, Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. All right, you guys are impossible. Um, so, uh, on the other hand, the other 12 gauge bosons get masses of the order of its four 10 to 15 GeV. Another way of looking at this. Wait, what, what mass is this? This is in this is in this SU5. This is what's called grand unification. So this is uh, the, so this so this is the scale of grand unification. Yes. So this, this scale has been broken again by going to the standard model. That's right. Because we've only done the first. That's right. Then there's a, the I in this wild. In the party line, there's another Higgs field yeah. that breaks things at around. Uh, well, we know what the scale is, actually. It's, um, I've forgotten what it is, but it's of the order of two or 300 GeV. Now, this theory is actually quite old. This was put forward by George I and Glashow in, I think, 1976, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it has a, not, a lot of nice things about it. One of the nice things about it is that, oh god, it, it, it more or less gets Actually, let, I haven't thought about this in so long. Let me not go on and, and tell you that. Let me, let me stay with the mathematics. Um, let me look at things in a little bit simpler way. As I said, this is, one, this is the convenient way to write the generators for SU5. For the case of the Higgs field, which is a 5 by 5 permission matrix and transforms in the adjoint representation. But you can always rewrite this this, this thing which has 24 components as a 24 dimensional vector and then so you can always write the uh, you can always say phi prime is EVI theta A TA is phi and you then say d mu phi is the ordinary derivative plus G well forget the I in this case A mu TA phi. And now, if phi has a mean value V in the vacuum, the mean value of the covariant derivative is G A A mu TA V. And um, you can then say a half D mu phi D mu phi is uh, G squared over 2 TA V, you see. Just, this is V, so this is TAV times that uh, TBV, and then this is actually a dot product of these two, A mu A, A mu B. And so you can rewrite that as a half A mu A mu squared A B A mu B. Well, and the mass matrix then is um, has components mu squared a b is g squared t a v dot t b v. And so th this this tells you something um, something nice, namely that if the generator t a leaves the leaves v invariant. What does that mean? That means the associated charge annihilates the vacuum because it doesn't, it doesn't change the vacuum. Okay? So for all those generators, you get mu squared a b zero. And for the other ones, you don't, and then you can diagonalize it. Okay, so so much for Anderson Higgs. What is the time? All right, 15 minutes. Um, 
Let me see what the next topic was. All right, let me just say a few words about non-relativistic field theory. This is really extremely simple. Suppose you have L is d mu, or let us just write it this way, d phi, d phi minus m squared, phi squared minus lambda Let's just write it that way. The equation of motion is d squared plus m squared. Okay, so this is the relativistic version. Now I suppose you want the analogous non-relativistic version. Then what you do, and, and you see this is a theory with particles of mass m. Okay. So the energies in this are going to be basically m plus epsilon. So you say big phi is e to the minus i m t little phi. So you say the energies in the, the non-relativistic theory? The energies, right, we're looking at the non-relativistic theory now. So there, there are excitations of this part of the vacuum which is zero. And so then, big phi, or d0, big phi then is what? Well, it's e to the minus i m t times minus i m uh, phi plus d0 phi. And d0 squared on big phi is d0 on this, which gives you all together minus i m squared minus 2 i m d0 phi plus d0 squared phi e to the minus i m t. Now we plug that up into this equation, and so this thing becomes e to the minus i m t minus m squared minus 2mi d0 phi plus d0 squared phi minus grad squared e to the minus i m t phi plus m squared phi e to the minus i m t equals zero. This term and this term cancel. Um, this term is much bigger than this term because m is huge. Okay. In other words, imagine we're thinking of the electron. Then the electron energies are EV if we're doing dense matter physics, and this is half an MEV. Kinetic energies are EV. Yeah. I'm saying the, the energy, the relevant energy scale for condensed matter physics is EV or less. Oh, okay. And the M is the mass of the electron, or even bigger if we were talking about other parts. And so after you've canceled those two, drop this. What's left is minus 2mi d0 phi minus grad squared phi equals 0, or I d0 phi is minus grad squared over 2m phi, which is the Schrodinger equation. But in that m squared term, you are missing a phi, right? That's because I'm fucked up. Yeah. Okay. conjugating this whole thing, or what's, is there like a bracket missing? Because this doesn't have the need to the, well I guess it does, but then that one, yeah. would, have, that one would have two though. So the bracket stops there. Oh, got it. I didn't see that. Okay.
All right, so basically the deal is, here's a, 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 a nice, slightly nicer way to do it. You replace the original relativistic field by, you put in a factor, 1 over square root of 2m, that makes the, makes things look a little nicer. E to the minus i m to m t, phi of x and t. You make that replacement. And then the kinetic energy part, which is d phi absolute value squared, say, goes to um, let, me, let me make this quick. I phi star phi dot minus phi star dot phi. And the Lagrange density becomes, and what Lagrange density? That one becomes, after you've done this thing and shaped and baked a little bit, you get I phi star phi dot minus 1 over 2m grad phi squared minus g phi squared no, phi to the fourth. Notice the mass term is gone. Where g squared is equal to lambda over 4m squared. So I'm glad I didn't skip this. Um, notice the mass term has, in this sense, the, in, 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 this mass term has gone away because it canceled that term in the time derivative. And so what you have is just this potential. This potential, by the way, is repulsive because it corresponds to an energy, g phi to the fourth. So it costs energy to pile up field in any particular place. Um, the relativistic theory has a conserved current, j mu, i phi star d mu phi minus uh, d mu phi star Whereas the non relativistic theory has J0 equal to phi squared and Ji J I equal to I over 2m, uh, or let us say J equal to I over 2m phi star grad phi minus grad phi star phi. <coughs> And they look very different because what happens when you go from a, a, a symmetric, a relativistically symmetrical or Minkowski symmetric theory to something that's non-relativistic, things don't look as nice. These look, I mean, these uh, conserved currents are related to like the, the probability of being conserved, right? For, the, for wave functions in the Schrodinger equation? Yeah, I think one can say that. And uh, on the other hand, in the relativistic case, it's um, that you have a phase symmetry. You have a U1 symmetry, so you have a conserved charge. Um, all right, we have just enough time for me to wrap up this uh, section, I think. Um, there are just basically a couple Two or three points. I don't know if I'm going to um, Don't go back that way. It's not the area yet. All right. Um, in the non relativistic theory, what is pi phi? Well, pi phi is partial Lagrange density with respect to phi dot, and that is I phi star. So we have a commutation relation, phi of x and t, uh, pi phi of x prime of t, 
which is I delta of x minus x prime. This is just the QP equals I h bar, essentially. And what that gives you then is phi of x and t phi star of x prime and t is um, delta of x minus x prime. In condensed matter, um, it's often good to, to make that transfer, to go to polar coordinates. Um, for the fields? Right, for, at least for this matter field, or water parameter, or whatever the hell it is. Let's go over here because uh, I'm just trying to find a few. Okay, um, so suppose we write phi equal to square root of rho e to the i theta. And uh, then this Lagrange density becomes i square root of rho e to the minus i theta. This is the non-relativistic form. Okay. D0 square root of rho e to the i theta minus 1 over 2m grad square root of rho e to the minus i theta dot grad square root of rho e to the i theta. Minus g squared rho squared. And rho after all, so this is the phi to the fourth term that we had. And this is then i over 2 rho dot minus rho theta dot minus 1 over 2m rho grad theta. So this is just expanding this stuff. 1 over rho, 4 rho, grad rho squared minus g squared rho squared. This is a total divergence. And so we ignore total, we can ignore total divergences. They don't affect the field equations. All right. Um, it can't be just that term, right? No. Excuse me? This is an I. Huh? Isn't that just a time derivative? Yes. Doesn't the total divergence need also the spatial parts? A total divergence is just a total derivative of something. Um, okay. So you can integrate it out. I mean, what, what, you're, what you're thinking of is yeah. d mu, j mu, well then this would be j0 dot plus branch plus, diver, plus divergence of j. So you, each, so you have four components, each of them has a particular derivative. So you're saying we're going to integrate be, them all out. We're going to be integrating over time in the action Time and space. Right. So in that case, that turns into code. Right. And the space integral, <clears throat> that goes away. And then you have this usual Razzmatazz at infinity, which is one of the things, just, just to be perfectly frank, that I've never been comfortable with any more than I'm comfortable with the answer I gave. <laughs> All right. So let's go through this um, pi theta here is partial L, partial theta dot, this is minus rho, and so we have, it turns out you then have rho of x and t, theta of x and prime and t, the equal time time theta is i delta x minus x prime. You, inter you define n, the number of particles, as the integral of rho d cubed x. You do that integration and you have n commutative theta of x of say just simply x and t is equal to i, and this tells you the number and phase of conjugate. All right, one. All right, I think the 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 other thing we can leave until next time.